Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Sopcic. I am an energy and climate reporter for Axios Pro. It is wonderful to be with here, you all here this morning. Thank you for joining us early to talk about AI and sustainability um, for our final interview today. I'm excited to welcome our next guest to the Axios stage, the co-founder and managing partner of Coefficient, Tom Hassenbuller. Tom, thank you for joining us. Um, I think maybe we should pick up on a thread that Andrew and Congressman Kasten were talking about. Um, and that's kind of the politics of energy right now, because they're a little bit stuck after the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. There's been a lot of discussion about permitting reform. I saw Senator Manchin's bill yesterday. Um, but lawmakers have had a lot of trouble agreeing on what that means and what we should do for the power grid. Um, I'm curious how you think the rise of AI and its implications for the energy sector could change that dynamic and you know, how will it affect the politics of energy? Thanks for the question and thanks for uh, inviting me to be here. It's, um, you're right, it's an exciting time to be in energy politics. You've heard already this morning, listening in the back room here, how AI will transform the economy. Uh, what AI will do while it's transforming the economy, I believe, is also force policymakers to really start to address modernization of our electric infrastructure as well as our digital infrastructure and start to think of those things a little more symbiotically. Um, you know, in the past, uh, even at the committee where I used to work at Energy and Commerce, um, a lot of these topics have been siloed. So you've seen, uh, you know, commerce and digitization people focus on the big data issues at large and not really talk about the energy needs, the energy usage. What AI has done in, uh, you know, the last several months, uh, especially, is really wake up the public to the need that energy infrastructure and electrification is digital infrastructure. And those things underpin each other. And we don't have, um, without growth in those sectors, we don't get to grow AI in the economy. And so uh, AI will also enable policy solutions that are going to help us think about how to address climate and energy policy a bit differently as well. And because of that, I think we've got a real ripe opportunity to reframe and almost reorient some of the policy narrative in Washington around these issues. And I'm quite optimistic about how that's going to play out. So, you know, as you alluded to, I think the energy sector, the private sector in general, is starting to wake up to the reality of increased power demand. Um, obviously, there's a lot of optimism about AI uh, from tech companies, as we heard. Um, and you testified uh, at one of the first hearings at this kind of nexus on the Hill. Um, I'm curious what you think the challenges to educating policymakers are mm -hmm. um, and, and where you see lawmakers starting to step in on this issue. Um, challenges wise, I think you've got uh, some new constituencies that are kind of intermingling with each other that haven't been done historically in Washington. Um, you know, the hearing that I testified in was at the House Energy and Commerce Committee. The Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee had a big hearing on AI. The takeaways that I had from that, and I think others uh, would probably agree, is that the tone of the hearing is a bit different. It immediately forces policymakers to confront these issues in a different way. You're looking at national security issues all of a sudden. You're looking at competition with China on AI. You're looking at, you know, we've heard about low growth and kind of the rise of demand on this. It forces this kind of un... Um, this lack of coordination that had been sort of um, not discussed before is now, you know, being front and center in, in, in these debates. And so to educate policymakers, I think you really need to kind of use some of the tools, the Department of Energy. We heard from Helena earlier about such, uh, uh, you know, all the great tools that they use. But again, they thought about this in these silos. And so going forward, what you've, you're going to have is new leadership at all the committees. You're going to have new chairman. You're going to have probably new ranking members, at least in the Senate, likely not in the House. Um, and so those new members are paying a lot of attention to these issues. Uh, they're already trying to kind of think outside the box on how to address them. And it gives, uh, it, it gives hope. Again, it's not going to be solved overnight. You know, yes, the politics aren't going to go away, but um, what AI will do is, you know, force policymakers to confront these issues in a new light and potentially find some opportunity. 
So we obviously heard from DOE today. On that sort of research and development and competition with China side, what else do you think the federal government needs to be doing? Well, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot that needs to be done. I think, um, you know, figuring out how to better integrate economic development into electric infrastructure development is one key missing link. Uh, you know, you, you hear a lot about like load forecasts and the challenges that utilities are having with kind of getting ahead of the curve on this. A lot of them have been caught kind of flat footed. Um, you know, I would almost call it radical collaboration is necessary between utilities, tech companies, and industrial and manufacturing sector, because as has been mentioned, it's not just an AI and data center boom that's causing a lot of this new load growth. It's electrification, it's re-onshoring of manufacturing. So Congress can help kind of help set the stage and the tone for how this plays out across the country by forcing folks to come to the table and think about these issues. Um, we talk a lot about transmission and interregional and regional grids. You know, the lifeblood of the economy is electric uh, power. And regardless of your positions on how it's actually fueled, the wires and the delivery of the electrons are super important in kind of how we think about these issues going forward because of so much new technology that's being enabled by AI, you have the ability to uh, dispatch differently, you have the ability to be more flexible in the demand side of the curve, you can be more active in the system. All these customers who are leading these um, transformative policies are very bullish on these new technologies, but they need policy and regulation to catch up to the plate, and frankly, it's way behind, and so that's where I see the optimism. Yeah, on that regulation catching up Side, um, you know, FERC just issued a, an, a rulemaking on regional transmission. <clears throat> People talk a lot about the need for in, uh, some kind of framework for interregional transmission, the big interstate power lines. Um, just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on that FERC rule and what else needs to be done. What, what are the next steps here on building out the grid? Yeah, so, I mean, first off, again, the economy is growing, so uh, we need more electric power, we need more transmission. Um, second, you know, I think Order 1920 is a good step in the right direction for moving us, in, moving the, us in that uh, process. What it really does and what's so important is, you know, customers who, you know, whether they're large industrial customers or residential customers, all have to pay for this transmission. That's all passed through in their rates. What, what the Order 1920 does is help to uh, integrate more economic planning uh, and more regional thought um, processes into the planning process and also will uh, require states and other folks to consider new technologies like grid enhancing technologies that are gonna help not only make the system work better and more efficiently, but also make this uh, save money. I mean, and, and really we're talking about major, you know, billions and billions of dollars of cost here. Every tool should be on the toolbox. You know, the challenges with the Order 1920 obviously are kind of the role, the historic tension between the federal government and the states and how that plays out in looking at the grid as an integrated system. Um, you know, every state has the power to control their own generation mix and uh, achieve their own decarbonization plans. But at, when you're trying to operate this as a country on a unified grid and while you're competing with China geopolitically and other places, you really need to think of this uh, in a much more holistic way. And that Order 1920 is a step in that direction. Again, there will be challenges. There already are lawsuits around it. Um, you know, I think with recent Supreme Court cases that have come out, Again, it puts the impetus back on Congress to really start to look at these issues. And you saw just in the Mansion uh, and Barrasso bill some, some sections on transmission uh, that was released yesterday. This thread is not going away anytime soon. In fact, I think it's going to get more integrated into the larger digital infrastructure conversation. So what about the, the generation side? Because I think this is a place where, especially Congress, tends to get a little polarized. You kind of fall into this, like, Democrats want transmission, Republicans want to make sure we have baseload power um, sort of framework. I'm not sure that's quite the way folks on the private sector side would look at it. But um, I'm curious, A, I mean, how you think you sh we should avoid AI data centers causing greenhouse gas emissions to spike? Um, and also sort of what the need is for baseload power in terms like gas, nuclear, that sort of thing. Yeah. 
Um, I think the way to, well, first off, most of the companies driving the AI revolution all have uh, very strong clean goals, clean energy goals, and so they're working around the clock to try to figure out ways um, to change business models, to innovate. Um, but again, a lot of the times they run into regulatory delays or they get stymied by kind of a, a very highly regulated electric infrastructure system that's very disparate. Um, on the flip side of that, I think um, when you look at generation issues, clean, firm baseload power has become kind of a, a thing that people talk about now. And I view that as a way, you know, we've, there's a lot of focus on nuclear, there's a lot of focus on new technologies. Um, there's companies that are stepping up to the plate economically who are driving some of these technologies and this new demand, putting skin in the game, putting actual resources down. Um, those types of arrangements, while they don't move fast, will have a, a very uh, high impact on the outcome of this and hopefully could turn down some of the temperature on, you know, sort of the generation fights. Um, you know, granted, we have a lot of retiring generations still. Yes, those are issues that need to be addressed. Um, yes, natural gas is currently part of the system and those things, but AI, just like in anything else, has ways of um, incentivizing and helping optimize methane emission leaks and other types of technologies too that can help clean up the existing system in a way that I think policymakers are just starting to get their heads around. Give us a vibe check of kind of what you're hearing from private sector clients. I mean, are people excited about the possible benefits of AI that you mentioned, anxious about the, the power load growth potential? I mean, what's, what's, how are people feeling right now? Um, I think anxious excitement is probably the right word to take both of yours. Uh, I think there's hope that this narrative will help kind of awaken people to think differently, like I said. And so I think, you know, by looking at the tone of the hearings, by looking at the high level of interest, I just got back from Nehruk last week where there, these topics were front and center in front of the state regulators. Um, but, you know, it is a new, uh, it, it's new. And so with anything new, there comes hype, there comes a little bit of fear, there comes a little bit of um, consternation among folks. And the politics hasn't quite shaken out yet. So I think from private sector clients, there's some nervousness about ultimately not knowing how it's going to play out while, you know, the threat of this being a global issue, this being, you know, real competition with, you know, China and other um, nations to dominate in the AI space. You know, that is what keeps folks up at night if we can't, you know, have a sense of national urgency around this issue to help address multi-state permitting and help address some of the bottlenecks that are prohibiting our low growth issues from happening, that's what keeps them up. What keeps you up? Which one of those issues really grabs you and think, you think it's a, a primary challenge in this space? Um, I think, you know, well, notwithstanding politics at large right now, I think the issue of you know, not being able to break through the politics to talk about what's good for the country here on this topic is what you know, makes me a little nervous. I think that, you know, I want to believe that, you know, you've got enough um, American innovation and ingenuity here and kind of leadership that that can kind of parse through party lines. Um, and I want to be optimistic that I think that will play out regardless of, you know, what happens in lame duck sessions or, you know, what people are focused on in Washington right now, it will play out next year in a way where, you know, Congress, is going to assert itself in a way that we might not have seen in a while because not just because of, you know, the new, the new Congress and new chairman and the, the, the you know, the, the day, uh, but, but also because of the, uh, the Supreme Court cases and some of the issues that have just come out, um, you know, really putting a, a, a bullseye on Congress to be, it's time to lead here and it's time to really think about how these things are going to get executed. And, the AI, you know, and data revolution that's happening and disrupting the entire economy, you know, mostly in a positive way. We have a lot of productivity. There are a lot of issues that you still have to work with, but, you know, that is a good story. And, and you know, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, you should want to see that optimized and enhanced and America lead on that topic. So we're running out of time here, but to wrap up, just give us a quick bold prediction or hot take about the future of this issue and where you think this is headed. Well, um, I think, sound like a broken record, but I will say only Congress can ensure that uh, the U.S. can power the AI revolution. Um, there's too many multi-state issues happening. And so because of that, you know, I think next Congress, AI will be the driving force. 
that will uh, enable one of the most significant pieces of legislation. It will, it, and it won't be called an energy bill or a climate bill. It'll be sort of a digital infrastructure bill that wraps these topics in, um, but also takes down the temperature on some of the partisan issues that have really plagued, um, you know, f frankly, these topics since the cap and trade debates and back to e Energy Policy Act of 2005 and seven, we haven't had a significant bill. So I'm bullish on Congress asserting itself and this potential opportunity being one that can help unite people. Well, Tom, we are out of time, so I'll have to leave it there. Thank you for joining us, and thanks to everyone in the audience and all of you that are watching on the live stream for joining this morning. Um, if you don't already, a uh, reminder to subscribe to any of our Axios newsletters at axios.com backslash newsletters. Uh, and if you're interested in subscribing to my newsletter, which is the Pro Energy Policy newsletter, please uh, come find me or somebody from Axios afterwards, and have a great rest of your morning. Thank you.